Welcome to the Far Hill Speaker Series. On behalf of the Wright Memorial Public Library and the Oakwood Historical Society, we are pleased to present the first in a series of three presentations about Dayton, Ohio and World War II. My name is Lee Turbin and I'm on the Board of Directors and the past president of the Oakwood Historical Society. As World War II rolled across the Atlantic, a flurry of war-related activities took place right here in Dayton, Ohio. From code breakers, to top secret laboratories, to Russian spies, the Dayton region's influence on World War II was indisputable. Today, we are pleased to introduce the World War II code breakers, the first presentation in our World War II trilogy. The World War II Codebreakers is a remarkable story about Joseph Desch, the Waves, and a top secret Navy project in NCR Building 26 here in Dayton, Ohio. The presentation will run about 45 minutes. Our presenter of the World War II Codebreakers is Jim Charters. He is a historian and spokesperson for Dayton History. Jim is one of our returning speakers and has given numerous presentations regarding the history and significant historical events in Dayton. He volunteers as an interpretive guide at Carillon Park, Woodland Cemetery, and Hawthorne Hill and received Carillon Park's Volunteer of the Year Award in 2013. And now, the World War II Codebreakers. In 1938, the president of National Cash Register Company, Edward Deeds, made a decision that would ultimately affect the lives of thousands of people worldwide. As you probably know, the company manufactured cash registers and accounting machines. Deeds decided to pursue an experimental concept using electronics and the hardware that NCR manufactured. To do this, he hired native Daytonian electrical engineer Joseph Desch, who had been working as an engineer at Frigidaire Corporation, to come to work at NCR and start an electronics laboratory. By 1941, Desch had two trusted researchers, Louis DeRosa and Robert Muma, and several technicians. These men, largely self-taught, were very bright and very curious. Together, they pursued the use of vacuum and gaseous tubes in advanced electronics. Through Deed's ties to MIT, Desch's laboratory was soon fulfilling contracts for the National Defense Research Committee. These contracts became more complex as the laboratory engaged in progressively serious and more complicated war contracts. One contract called for high-speed electronic counters which was actually for the Manhattan Project, although Deeds and his staff did not know at the time the real purpose of that project. Deeds had built the counters for the University of Chicago and personally delivered them to Edward Taylor. These high-speed electronic counters were used in the atom bombs that were dropped in Hiroshima and Nagasaki in World War II. At the beginning of World War II, the Germans used an electromechanical device called Enigma to encode the data they transmitted in order to ensure that their messages were not intercepted. Arthur Schriebus, a German engineer, developed his Enigma machine in the hopes of interesting commercial companies in secure communications. In 1923, he set up his Cyber Machine Corporation in Berlin to manufacture his product. The Enigma looked much like a portable typewriter with its own wooden carrying case. It scrambled each keystroke of a message through a series of tumbling rotors that turned the results into a stream of meaningless letters. Within three years, the German Navy was producing its own version, followed by the Army in 1928 and the Air Force in 1933. Britain and her allies first understood the problems posed by this machine in 1931 when Hans Schmidt, a German spy, allowed his French spy masters to photograph stolen Enigma operating manuals. Initially, however, neither the French nor the British could make headway in breaking the Enigma cipher. It was only after they had handed it over 
to the Polish cipher bureau that progress was made. Helped by its closer links to the German engineering industry, the Poles managed to reconstruct an Enigma machine, complete with internal wiring, to read the German forces messages between 1933 and 1938. With German invasion imminent in 1939, the Poles opt to share their secret with the British and Britain's government code and cipher school in Betchley Park outside of London. This became the center for Allied efforts to keep up with the dramatic war-induced changes in Enigma output. The Enigma machine was used by all branches of the German military as their main device for secure wireless communications until the end of World War II. Several types of Enigma machines were developed before and during World War II, each more complex and harder to code break than its predecessors. The most complex Enigma machine was used by the German Navy. It was important that these messages be intercepted because it was estimated that one out of five Allied seamen died as a result of German U-boats. German Admiral Karl Donitz, Supreme Commander of the German Navy, kept in close radio contact with his skippers, requiring them to report their positions and fuel supplies with every communication. Once an Allied convoy was located, Donuts gathered the available U-boats into what was called wolf packs to maximize their killing power and their defensive strength. The frequent radio contacts between German headquarters and the U-boats gave the Allies ample opportunity to intercept and to home in on the signals with the latest direction-finding equipment. But the direction-finding equipment was simply that. It could show the Allies what path the U-boat had been following but not its destination. To determine whether subs were going and why, whether to attack, regroup, refuel, or head home, the Allies needed to read the content of the radio messages, and that was a far more daunting challenge. In transmitting its signals, the German High Command made optimal use of the Nazis' remarkable encryption machine, the Enigma. In simplest terms, the Enigma put German radio messages into an encrypted form of seamless random letters. The Enigma machine on the receiver's edge was set up exactly the same way, which returned the cipher to plain text. The Germans were confident that the coding system was impenetrable. Even if their machines were captured, and they had a good reason to be, theoretically at least, the number of ciphering possibilities generated by the advanced naval Enigma in 1942 was far greater than all the number of atoms in the universe. This Enigma machine has three rotors, and that's important. The Enigma was like a typewriter that encoded message by scrambling each keystroke through a series of rotors. To send an encrypted message, the operator set the Enigma electric and mechanical settings, the plug wirings and the rotor wheels, to a predefined initial combination known to him and to the receiving operator. He then typed in the text message on his Enigma keyboard. When the clerk pressed a letter on its keyboard, the corresponding cipher text letter lit up on the display panel at the top of the machine and was written down by a second clerk. Once the entire message had been scrambled into cipher text, it was then transmitted using a standard Morse code radio transmitter from the submarine to headquarters and vice versa. Again, for each type letter, a different letter was lit up in the upper board. Now, for the benefit of you engineers out there, I'll provide a little more detail. Pressing down a key, advance the first rotor forward one letter and send an electric current through the wiring of the Enigma's four rotors. All but the last rotor were joined to a ring with a tumbler pin on it. That, in turn, advanced the next rotor. So after the first rotor moved through all 26 letters of the alphabet, it would tumble the third, much like the mileage numbers on the odometer of a car. As a result, the Enigma would never repeat the same positions of its scrambling wheels for hundreds of thousands of keystrokes. The ever-changing wheel positions of the Enigma were only the beginning of the code breaker's nightmare. 
Each rotor was wired to scramble the letters in a different way, and all the rotors but the fourth could be ordered differently within the machine from left to right. The different wirings for the rotors and the different orders for placing each rotor inside the machine created another staggering set of enciphering possibilities. If all that weren't enough to drive the code makers mad, the Germans added what looks like a tiny telephone switchboard to the front of the machine, on which double-ended wires called steckers in German could be plugged into jacks for swapping individual letters, so A became E, for instance, and vice versa. Anywhere from 1 to 13 different letters could be steckered in this way. The stucker board proved to be one of the biggest headaches in breaking the enigma. With, 26, with 20 letters steckered to one another and six letters unplugged, which was standard practice during the war, the number of plug board possibilities alone was 533 trillion. The fourth and final disk, called the reflector, served to reroute the current back through the first three wheels ensuring that the plain text and the scrambled text were always reciprocal at the same setting. That way, the clerk receiving the ciphered message could set up the machine the same way, then type in the scrambled text and automatically reproduce the original plain text. The German military liked the economy and simplicity of the Enigma operation. One machine could do both tasks of enciphering and deciphering messages. The receiving operator wrote the received encrypted message, set his enigma machine to the same predefined combination, and typed the message at the machine's keyboard. Typing the encrypted message on his enigma machine with the same combinations of settings deciphered it so that the operator read the original text message lit in the upper board as he typed. The enigma machine could generate billions upon billions of possible letter combinations. The German high command were so confident that their Enigma machine was foolproof they became arrogant. Some junior officers started to believe during the war that the messages were being intercepted. They wondered how the Allies knew where they were going to be at a certain location. But when the junior officers suggested to their superiors that their messages were being intercepted, the superior officers lashed out at them saying, that's impossible. This is what an Enigma generated message looks like. The top part of the Enigma setting, the lower part of the, the, the top part gives the Enigma setting. The lower part is the message with the letter divided into five letter blocks. Everything is capitalized, there's no punctuations. But unbeknownst to the Germans, the Poles and the Brits have been able to crack the three rotor. Enigma machine relying in parts on captured German documents. This is a German sub being captured. The Allies captured German subs and were able to hold, get hold of an Enigma machine to figure out how it worked. But when the Germans added a fourth rotor on February the 1st, 1942, the number of possible combinations for producing any one letter overwhelm their decrypting abilities. When the fourth rotor was added, the total number of combinations was 10 to the 145th power. By comparison, the number of all the atoms in the universe is 10 to the 82nd power. The great efforts to code break the enigma required to combine efforts and talents of brilliant engineers, code breakers, intelligence officers, and communications experts deeply familiar with German language and mentality, and with the radio operator's mentality and procedures. Sometimes the German operators would get sloppy. They might start every message they send with Heil Hitler, or they might acknowledge their wife or girlfriend and use their name. When they did that, the Allies knew what those letters were and did not have to spend time trying to figure them out. Breaking the code also required daring and skillful combat operations, mainly at sea, some carefully planned and some exporting rare opportunities. Breaking into an enigma was like trying to open a series of locked doors. Each door could have thousands or even trillions upon trillions of possible keys, 
but only one would open it. And not until all the doors were open could the message be read. Luckily, some of the doors have been pried open through the capture of Enigma components and operating instructions. The Enigma code breakers use an increasing number of machines nicknamed BOM, B-O-M-B-E, which provided electromechanical computing power, which helped them significantly shorten the process of deciphering the Enigma messages. The Poles had a breakthrough early on that laid the groundwork for the British. The Poles called their first decoding machine BOM, perhaps after the brand of ice cream cone that favored by the code breakers, or perhaps because a loose chunk of metal dropped on the floor whenever the machine arrived at a solution. Just before Poland fell to the Nazis' blitzkrieg in 1939, the Poles shared their secrets with both the British and the French. But it was the British who capitalized on this remarkable feat. Operating from a top secret government code in Cypher School at Betchley Park outside of London, British code breakers refined and further mechanized the device based on the advanced work of mathematician Alan Turing. The British machine was also dubbed the bomb, perhaps as a nod to the contributions of the Poles, or as others say, because it had a menacing ticking sound. Turing invented a complicated machine that tried to run the Enigma code backwards in order to decipher the messages. Each time the Germans made a variation of the code, England had to reprogram its device. When the Germans added a fourth rotor wheel, which increased the possible letter combinations, it made the British bomb machine obsolete. What was needed, and in a hurry, was a high-speed decoding machine that could run through all the possible Enigma combinations at heretofore unheard of speeds. A machine that the British had been working on since 1941 without success. Navy theoreticians at MIT envisioned an all-electronic machine many times faster than the bomb machine. But only two companies in the United States had the technical capacity at that time to produce such a marvel, IBM and Dayton's NCR. The obvious choice for the Navy was NCR, where chairman of the board, Colonel Edward Deeds, had a long working relationship with MIT as well as the Navy's top brass. It also had idle capacity. NCR, unlike IBM, had been ordered by the War Production Board to stop making its major product cash registers for the duration of the war to conserve much needed materials. The project would ultimately be self-contained inside NCR's Building 26 at the corner of Stewart Street and Patterson Boulevard. It was so named because it was the 26th structure to rise on the company's 90-acre business campus. It was only by coincidence that the work in Building 26 would revolve around the seemingly endless possibilities of scrambling the 26 letters in the alphabet. NCR was heavily involved in wartime manufacturing, making product for the war effort. Here we see women assembling fuses at NCR in 1942. Here we have men working on the Oler Lichen Gun ma Magazine in 1942 in NCR as well. At the end, the weight of the Navy's demand and the nation's would fall most heavily on one man's shoulders, those of Joseph Desch. A modest but brilliant engineer at age 35, he had at NCR's Electronic Research Laboratory. Desch had already contributed to the war effort, unknowing at the time, by inventing an electric counter capable of operating at one million counts per second, at least a hundred times faster than anything achieved before for developing the first atom bomb. Unlike the Navy's theoretical engineers, who were mostly graduate students and professors at MIT, Desch was a floor-trained industrial genius as savvy about front office politics as he was about state-of-the-art electronics. This is the American bomb machine designed by Joseph Desch. The bomb project 
would not only prove to be the biggest technical challenge of Desch's career, but an overwhelming emotional drain. For the next two years, it would mean working 14-hour days under mounting pressure from the Navy officials. Speaking of mounting pressure, can you imagine going to work every day and seeing a poster that, that described how many people died the day before because your project was not complete? Uh, that's what he faced. It would mean severing relations with his German immigrant relatives. It would mean being placed on 24-hour surveillance with a supervising officer quartered in his home. For the duration of the war, his life would be pinned under a microscope. The man responsible for designing and building the U.S. bomb machine was racing not only against the Germans, but against his own endurance. And before it was over, Joseph Desch would suffer from a nervous breakdown. Now begins the story of how the Navy waves played a Rosie the Riveter-like role in cracking the code. WAVES is an acronym for Women Accepted for Volunteer Emergency Service. And since they were part of the Navy, WAVES was a play on words. When the WAVES arrived in Dayton, they stayed at a place called Sugar Camp. John H. Patterson, the founder of NCR, first opened the camp in 1894 for the purpose of training his company's salesmen. This was located on land near the west end of Shantz Road, just south of the NCR factory complex. In the 1920s, the original tents were replaced by 60 cabins to accommodate his sales force. It was in these cabins that the wave stayed. In 1942, after Navy boot camp at Hunter College campus in the Bronx and three weeks of background checks, testing, training, and indoctrination in Washington, D.C., 70 young women boarded trains at Union Station in Washington, D.C. for a top secret assignment they were told they could never discuss, even among themselves. And their destination was described only as out west. They were bright and adventurous, patriotic women, most of them in their early 20s, who had enlisted in the waves, selected from good families all over America and from the biggest cities to the smallest towns. It is easy to understand how as their train steamed westward, uh, many of their recruits probably entertained fantasies of a tour of duty in Southern California with movie stars and sunny beaches and pleasant times. But those dreams were abandoned when they debarked later on that day at Union Terminal in Dayton, Ohio. It rained and it rained and it rained that month Wave Catherine Ratz, who had been a telephone operant in Boston, thought, oh my gosh, is it going to rain here forever? She was one of the <clears throat> first of 600 waves in all to assemble bombs in 1943 and 1944. Their skill and pledge of, secure, of uh, security were desperately needed to offset the wartime shortage of men. The Waves organization, less than one year old, had been born in controversy. Concerned about the extra cost and administrative problems, the Navy brass had resisted strong political pressures to enact the women's service until spring of 1942. But once Congress passed the enabling legislation in June, the Navy quickly set up programs using the leaders of America's elite women's colleges as the top officers to assure the public and the recruits that the ways would be respectable ladylike members of the armed services. A savvy advertising campaign by former journalist and publicist Louise K. Wilde emphasized the glorious aspects of naval service, fashionable uniforms, training on college campuses, unusual work, and opportunity to meet men. This all attracted a large number of enlistees. The Navy knew that in order to compete with much higher wages offered in the private market, it would have to supplement its meager salaries for, <clears throat> for the women volunteers with plenty of amenities, comfortable living quarters, decent food, and where possible recreation facilities and dating opportunities. The WAVES leaders were able to avoid the Navy's anti-fraternization rules, allowing WAVES and male officers to date and to even marry. 
The Wave's leadership took an almost material interest in their young charges. While the enlisted Navy men on the bomb project were left to fend for themselves in Dayton's crowded wartime housing market, the Waves were quartered at Sugar Camp, a private compound of rustic cabins nestled among the wooded hilltops overlooking the NCR campus. NCR gave the Navy full use of Sugar Camp. The Navy found ways to help the women, found ways to help the women relax. Once their shifts ended, the Waves were free to enjoy themselves either on or off the sugar camp grounds. Curfews were seldom enforced. There were ball games and poolside activities just outside their cabin doors and movies and skits at the sugar camp auditorium. The camp cafeteria never closed. The food was excellent, one of the ways recalled. I know we had a lot of good beef, things that people on the outside didn't have during the war. She also recalled the special advantages of living next to the sugar camp pool. We went skinny dipping in between the times the night watchman made his rounds. Getting around town was never a problem for the waves. Even though the camp's Navy transported an old woody station wagon often broke down and had to be pushed. One of the ladies said whenever we were going, people would stop and ask us if we would like a ride. She went on to say, of course, in those days, no one ever harmed us. The age of innocence was still intact. During the cold months, the conditions at Sugar Camp weren't always a height of comfort, however. The waves bunked as many as eight in cabin, and that had been designed for to house just four. Two guests on each side with a shower and a toilet and a pair of sinks in between. The unheated structures were rustic and charming, built entirely of wood with lattice windows and built-in closets and bed each with its own writing table, gooseneck lamp, and fan. In the fall of 1943, heat was added to the barracks. A routine was soon established. The waves would march under guard from Sugar Camp down Schantz Road, down Main Street to Building 26 at NCR. To maintain discipline and esprit de corps, the waves marched in full uniform, their hair pinned neatly behind their hats, to their shifts. One of the ways recalled that we marched all the time, every day, no matter what the weather. Each morning, traffic was halted on Main and Stewart Street as 200 waves strode four abreast a mile or so from Sugar Camp to NCR's Building 26. They were hard to miss, especially for enlisted men looking for female attention. Now the waves were given a cover story if any of the civilians asked them what they were doing. They were to tell the civilians that they were there to learn how to use the accounting machines. Years later, after the project was declassified, one of the waves said, the people of Dayton must have thought we were idiots. Why would it take two years to learn how to use an accounting machine? It was in Building 26 that the waves assembled parts for the bombs. Because of the utmost secrecy that was involved in the work, it was compartmentalized to the nth degree. 600 waves were brought into NCR's corporate headquarters in Dayton and given very specific tasks to perform, usually involving wiring, soldering, to ultimately build a sufficient quantity of decryption devices to routinely uh, break the Enigma code, of course. If the Germans had ever realized the Allies were quite so handy at breaking their code, they would have instantly moved on to another encryption device. Therefore, it was necessary to break the code but never disclose even the slightest hint that um, it had been successfully broken. Waves were never to discuss their work with each other or their families. In Building 26, each woman was given a graph to follow pieces of different colored wires, and soldering equipment. The waves work from blueprints and diagrams to wire, solder, and assemble parts of this massive bombs. Each task performed in a separately guarded and locked room so that no one could identify the whole machine or even a component. A wave never met any of the other workers in Building 26 other than those assigned to a room. The Navy often sacrificed efficiency for secrecy. The wave would be given a wiring diagram from one side of a commuter wheel, while the second wave worked on the other side of the wheel 
in a separate room. The waves on the first floor had no knowledge of what was being done on the second floor above them. Their job was to ultimately build a sufficient quantity of decryption devices to break the Enigma code. The waves worked around the clock, three shifts per day. Since their work was so compartmentalized, few suspected the real purpose of their work, which was to duplicate the wiring of the Enigma machines. Even if they had guessed the purpose, they would have had to keep quiet upon the threat of being shot for treason had they ever talked. Here we see a dash bomb and one of the many rotors on the machine. Each silver point had to be soldered individually. The machines were shipped to Washington, D.C., where the actual code breaking took place. The work was extremely tedious and tiring for the waves. After wiring one rotor, the waves would immediately be given another one to work on. Later, many of the waves were transferred to the Naval Communication Annex, on Nebraska Avenue in Washington, D.C., where they were allowed to know more about the full nature of their work in Dayton. However, grave secrecy was still maintained. Women in the project were lectured by a security officer. If you ever tell what you're doing, you're committing treason. And just because you're young ladies, you won't be treated any differently than the men who commit treason. If you ever tell, we will shoot you. Eventually, 121 Dayton built encryption machines, or bombs as they were codenamed, were set up in Washington in bays of four bombs per bay. Each bay operator was operated by four wave operators and a supervisor. Three shifts per day were kept going in order to keep the bombs busy at all times. By 1944, the Americans were routinely breaking the U-boat messages usually within 12 hours of the sub broadcasting it. There was a joke going around at the time. If the Germans wanted to get their messages faster, it would be quicker if they just called Washington. The waves worked in Dayton and Washington, D.C., and that work was absolutely key to the secret decryption of the U-boat transmissions back and forth with their headquarters. Most importantly, it enabled the Allies to intercept the U-boats and destroy their supply chain, thus rendering the German most formidable naval weapon almost useless. These women sailors who worked in secret could not share their stories until decades later, but were genuine heroes and who helped shorten and change the course of World War II. Production was stopped in September 1944 after 121 bombs had been made. The last manufactured U.S. Navy bomb is on display at the U.S. National Cryptology Museum in Fort Meade, Maryland. It has been told that there may be the existence of a second bomb. Whether it remains in storage in pieces, waiting to be discovered, or no longer exists is unknown. It has been said that the breaking of the Enigma Code was virtually as important to winning World War II as the Manhattan Project. It was one of the best kept secrets despite nearly 1,000 people working on the problem. Can you imagine 1,000 people working on such a problem today? People who have to check their cell phones every 15 minutes for text messages. But the secret almost got out. The enemy within, James Martin Montgomery Jr. He worked the night shift in Building 26. 23-year-old man, one generation removed from the hard scrabble hills of eastern Kentucky, a self-educated, self-proclaimed electrical engineer. He's hardworking, he's bright, reliable. He was promoted from assembler to checker to lab technician in less than two months after being hired in August 1943. He lived with his wife Lillian in Franklin, Ohio. He registered with NCR Share Ride, offering space in his 1937 Chrysler Coupe to fellow workers who lacked transportation. And that was his downfall. One of his co workers took him up on the offer. At the end of his shift on the morning of November the 5th, 1943, Montgomery told his co worker that he would meet him in the parking lot and drive him home. It was almost 6 a.m. on this damp, chilly morning as Montgomery his co-worker headed to the parking lot behind Building 26. No records are available on exactly what happened next, but it's easy to imagine when the writer 
reached Montgomery's car. He opened the passenger's door and slipped inside to warm himself. Once settled, he pulled out a cigarette, puffed it in his mouth, then instinctively reached for the matches in his shirt pocket, but he couldn't find any. Desperate for a smoke, the co-worker must have pulled open the glove compartment of the car. As he rooted around the loose papers there, he found no matches. But what he did find must have given him reason to pause. He found a small stack of 3 by 5 white index cards. Uh, these were filled with the typewritten names of foreign people and organizations, most of them German and Japanese. There were nearly 40 listings in all, all 13 separate cards. There was also a letter from the German embassy addressed to James Montgomery. Hastily, the co-worker slipped everything back into the glove compartment, trying to rearrange the items exactly as he found them. And he waited for Montgomery and his wife, who also worked at NCR, to arrive. He probably said little to the couple as they drove him home that morning, while his mind and emotions churned with questions. Should he call the Navy security when he got home? The FBI? By the time his shift started at 7 p.m., he knew exactly what to do. He informed his supervisor. At 7 p.m., when they reported for work at NCR, Montgomery and his wife were immediately taken into custody by naval security officers and placed under Marine Guard inside Building 26. They were held there for questioning without benefit of an attorney for at least two days, and Montgomery may have been held for as long as a week, completely isolated from the outside world. They faced the dilemma of unnerving proportions. How could Montgomery be arrested and prosecuted for espionage without alerting the press and blowing the lid off the top secret work at NCR? If they let him go free, he would surely deliver the secret to the hands of the enemy. It was suggested that Montgomery be arrested on charges of theft of government property and immediately placed in jail. While searching his home, they found some electrical equipment he had taken from work valued at $35. He was charged with stealing $35 worth of electrical equipment and sentenced to five years in jail. His attorney was never told what was going on in Building 26 and couldn't understand why his punishment was so harsh. While doing research for this talk, I discovered quite by surprise that James Montgomery's attorney was my uncle, Thomas Ryan. My uncle never t was told about the secret in Building 26 or the real reason why they were holding his client. Montgomery was kept away from prisoners while he was incarcerated. Montgomery was released on parole six weeks after the end of World War II. He never revealed anything to anyone. Now this is a picture of Debbie Desch Anderson, Desch's daughter, and a citation for Joseph Desch. Joseph Desch died in 1987, taking his secret to his grave, but his contributions did not go unrecognized. A citation from President Harry S. Truman hung on the wall of his study, along with a Medal of Merit awarded in 1947. Truman's citation praised Desch's work without actually mentioning what it was. When the project was declassified, Joseph Desch's daughter, Debbie Anderson, decided to have a reunion of the waves and the engineers who had worked with her father on the bomb project so that all may realize the important part they played during World War II. In all, 81 waves would make their way back to date, along with 18 sailors and nine NCR engineers. When they were finally told how many thousands of lives their, their contributions saved, most of them just broke down and cried. Each way was awarded an Exceptional Service Award from the National Security Agency. This is the highest award given to civilians. In the 1960s, an addition was built around the original Building 26 building. In the early 2000s, the University of Dayton bought the land that Building 26 stood on. They slated the building for demolition. An effort was made to save it, but it was determined that too much of the original building couldn't be restored. The building was torn down in 2008. The IEEE boulder and plaque that sat outside the building and the architectural remnants of the building were moved to Carillon Historical Park. 
In 2011, Carillon Park opened a new exhibit that incorporated the architectural remnants of Building 26. Also on display is a rotor and electronic tubes from the Desh bomb. And you can walk in and look around one of the Waves cabins that is uh, on the grounds of Carillon Historical Park. And this cabin was occupied by the Waves during World War II. It is said that the work done by Joseph Desh and the Waves may have shortened World War II by up to two years. If you wish to learn more about what we discussed today, I highly recommend the book, The Secret in Building 26, by Jim DeBras and Colin Burke. Another excellent source for the Codebreaker story is a DVD titled Dayton Codebreakers, produced by Aileen LeBlanc. This talk is not associated with either the documentary Dayton Codebreakers or the website Dayton Codebreakers. People living here in the Miami Valley can be extremely proud of the work accomplished by the World War II Codebreakers.